Today we are starting a new series. We finished our uh, series on Romans. So we'll be going through the book of Acts now. And Nathan, of course, is gone now. I think, I don't know, he's hanging out with the Pope, I think, is where he's at. Somewhere in Italy doing something. So anyway, so he'll be back in a couple weeks. But um, the book of Acts is very, you know, it's a very interesting, it's, a, it's an action book. Sometimes it's called the, the Acts of the Apostles. Other times it's called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you could call it the Great Adventure. Because you, you think about how, you know, you go through the Gospels and you have the, the testimony of Jesus, his life, his resurrection, and then you kind of wonder, okay, now, how does this work out? What happens next? How does this message go out to the world? And it's interesting, it, it was written by the physician Luke, and he's about the only Gentile writing in our Bible, and he's writing to a guy by the name of Theopolis, who is another Greek name, and actually his name means God lover. And if you think about how much work went to that, so he's writing to one person, and in the book, Gospel of, of Luke, you think of all the details that he's writing to this one person, giving him the whole history of what happened with Jesus and his, and his life. And it looks like most experts believe that he took a lot of information from John Mark. And if you remember, John Mark was the guy who, in the book of, of Mark, when Jesus was arrested, he had a linen cover on, and he escaped, when they arrested Jesus, naked. So that's his testimony, you know. I flew, fled decade. And later we find that John Mark is, um, as Paul and Barnabas are setting out on their first missionary journey, they take John Mark with them. And then about halfway through the, the travels, all of a sudden, whether he got homesick or whether it was just too hard, he returned back to Jerusalem. And so the next time, the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him, but Paul said, no way, this guy left us. He, he, you know, he set his hands to the plow, and he looked back. And so they had such a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they separated, and Barnabas ended up taking Mark with him while Paul took uh, Silas. But at the end, as you get to like Timothy, you find out that Paul is saying, hey, bring Mark. He's very useful for me in the service of the Lord. So obviously there is a reconciliation of that division that happened. But it's also kind of encouraging to see sometimes there's division within the body, strong personalities, and yet God has a way to heal those and bring that thing all around. So it's thought, the book of Acts is thought to be written about 62 A.D., okay? And it covers about a 30-year a period of the early church. And many times, uh, you know, we think of Luke being a physician, a doctor, that he was well off or something. But really that wasn't the case during the Roman Empire. A lot of times, uh, physicians, doctors were actually slaves, and some of the more rich people uh, would have a slave, obviously a very intelligent slave, that has some medical understanding, and they would serve that person, and their job was to keep that person alive. But it, by this time, we know that Luke is already a free man. Some think that perhaps Theopolis could be who he was actually a slave to. We don't know for sure. That's kind of speculation. But we do know that Theopolis was a high ranking because if you go to the gospel, it says he addresses him as most excellent Theopolis. In other words, he was probably someone of high standard. He could have been in the Roman government. Uh, 
And so he's writing, taking all that time, writing, giving him the details, and not really thinking, I'm sure, when he wrote that, oh, hey, it's going to be a book, and it's going to sell millions of copies, and I'm going to be famous. You know, he was just writing the facts. So, and I'm sometimes, you know, you, you think of the book of Acts, and I think of it kind of as a blueprint for the church. What is the church supposed to look like? And it's also, to me, very convicting because I think, okay, this is what the New Testament church looked like, and this is what we look like. You know, in many areas, we are falling short. You know, when I think of how, how evangelistic those guys were who went out, went out to people who never heard the name of Jesus, and how fast the church growth happened, and the signs and wonders that follow their ministry. So it, it's also convicting to compare the modern church to the, to the book of Acts. So let's start with verse 1. I'm just going to kind of go through verse by verse. Verse 1, he says, In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. I want you to think of that little phrase there, to do and to teach. I think of a couple of different things there. I think about you know, the saying that we always say, practice what you preach. Jesus lived it. He didn't only taught, but he lived it. And number two was that Jesus had signs and wonders, healings, miracles that followed his ministry. Which we are, while pursuing that, we are definitely short compared to the book of Acts. I remember Paul Cain, uh, I, I would see sometimes him minister, and he would sometimes quote that verse, and he would say, begin to do and to teach. And what he would do, he would begin to, you know, there'd maybe be 1,500 people, 2,000 people in the room, and he'd begin to call people out, reading their mail and giving prophetic words. And then after he did maybe a half dozen or a dozen people, then he'd begin to teach. After that. Okay, verse 2. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, that was Jesus' main ministry, the kingdom of God. And he appeared over a period of 40 days. So do you ever kind of wonder what that looked like? I mean, he would just kind of pop up in a room, and then he'd be, then he'd be gone. Then they, we don't know how long between his appearances but he was showing up over a period of 40 days, teaching them because they needed a lot more instruction. Because remember when, when Jesus kept telling them, hey, I'm, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to write, and, and you know, like Peter goes, that will never happen to you, Lord. You know, and Jesus has to go get behind me, Satan. I mean, they had a, a, a whole different paradigm shift they had to go through. And to realize this wasn't about Israel, this was about the world. Also, the 40 days, think about this. There's 50 days between the Passover and Pentecost, okay? So they appeared to him over a period of 40 days. Then he was in the grave three days or partial three days. Depends how you want to count it. So you have about a week, seven, eight days before the day of Pentecost came. And so he's teaching them. He's showing up his proofs. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6 and 7, I wonder, I'll just read that to you. 
He said, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most who are still alive and some have fallen asleep. That doesn't mean they were taking a nap. That means a, a euphemism for they died. Okay. So there's over 500 people, other people, who saw him all at one time. So there's a lot of witnesses, live people who, are, who saw the risen Lord. And that next verse, in verse 7, it says, Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, last of all to me. Paul speaking of himself. And it seems like, to me, that is one of the qualifications for apostleship, is someone who has seen the risen Lord. And like in Paul's case, it was years before he actually saw the risen Lord, saw Jesus. And if you also remember that James and his brothers really did not believe that Jesus was who he said he was until they saw him, the risen Lord. And that would have a tendency to kind of change your mind, right? See someone, and you, and you can, you know, give them grace because can you imagine growing up with Jesus, what that would be like? Talk about sibling rivalry and Mary, Jesus hit me. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm sure, you know. I mean, that, that would be a hard road to go. All right, let's look at verse 4 and 5. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. For the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting because in, uh, in John 20, 22, it says that as Jesus is speaking to disciples, and he said, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So they received the Holy Spirit at that point. But there's a difference. He's talking about something way beyond that, what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that being in, enveloped by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so he tells them to wait into Jerusalem until they receive that. So, verse 6, their response is, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you, you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So, so often, sometimes we, we get wrapped up in end times. And for them, it's probably a reasonable question to ask because their thinking, again, was all about Israel and reestablishing the kingdom and throwing off the Roman Empire. And it's like, you know, the Lord is saying, we have bigger fish to fry than that. This is the bigger story. And I think sometimes we get caught up in that a little bit too much also. That we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. Verse 7 and 8. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times... Our dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, in other words, you need to focus on what the mission is the tax that is on at hand. And I always picture that as, you know, if you take a, a rock and you throw it into a pond 
and you see that initial splash, that was like the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. And then you notice that it begins to spread. The ripples go out circular, and it goes to Judea, and then it goes to Samaria, and then it goes to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so that was the plan that the Lord had in mind. So it's in enlarging their vision for what they thought this was all about. This is going to the ends of the earth. This is taking back the things that have been given to Satan. Says the God of this world, I'm reclaiming the kingdom. I'm re reclaiming the earth. Verse 9. And he said to them, and he said this, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. Now, this wasn't a a, round, a, you know, a rain cloud. This was the cloud of glory that came down. And then he's taking up. And I think about, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus and, and, and Peter, James, and John were on the mountain, and then Elijah and Moses show up, and then the disciples are just enthralled that they're there and then it says a cloud came down and they fell on their face because it was the glory cloud and then a voice comes out of the cloud and says this is my beloved son listen to him and so I imagine as they're looking and, and you know think about those things in the Old Testament like when when Solomon was dedicating the temple and the, and the Shekinah glory of God fell and the priests could not stand to minister. And so I'm sure the disciples sitting there, you know, as they're watching and their mouths are like, you know. Verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There's some different comments about who the two men were. You know, sometimes some scholars think it was just two angels. Some others think it was Moses and Elijah. We can't really say, except there were two men. And basically saying, okay, quit looking and get to work, basically. And this same one who you saw him go in glory in a cloud. He is coming back in the flesh, in glory. To save a broken and dark world. Verses 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives. A Sabbath day walk from the city. Now when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those presents were Peter, John, James, and Andrew. Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women the, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, it's interesting that this is the last time that Mary is mentioned in Scripture. Now, our Catholic brothers sometimes, um, actually, some will pray to Mary, or they will... Uh, say rosaries 
while I believe that Mary is to be honored, we don't pray to Mary. And I think of that scripture where, you know, Jesus was in Capernaum, and his mother and his brothers came, and they said, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside. And Jesus said, who's my mothers and brothers? Those who do the will of our Father. So while I think she should be honored, she should not be you, even some have even prayed for forgiveness of sin to Mary. So I think while we want to honor her, we have to keep her in a proper specific. But another thing in that I said they were constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. You know, Steve brought up a point that he wants to start doing some prayer meeting on Wednesday nights in January, and I think it's much needed, but I'm also reminded that we did, what, three or four months worth uh, on, on Wednesday night, well, Jesse Getz would lead worship, and, and we'd, but we usually have a handful of people, and I've always said that this, the smallest church service is always the prayer meeting. And yet prayer is so vitally important. It's like if you ask everybody, is prayer important? Well, sure, prayer is important. Prayer makes a difference. But they don't do it. It's kind of way down on the list. And yet it needs to be one of our main focus to be, this is called a house of prayer. It's what Jesus said. So it's not about a spectator sport about us all involved, all using our gifts, all praying together. They were constantly in that place of prayer. So I just want to encourage you guys on these upcoming prayer nights on Wednesday night. Be here. Join together. Be of one heart. Join in prayer. All right, verse 15 through 17. Take out a little paragraph. It says, In these days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus and he was the one, and he was one of our numbers and shared in this ministry. So this was a pre-planned by God. I always say, you know, what Satan thought was his greatest victory turned into his greatest defeat. In fact, in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.8, let me turn over there real quick. First Corinthians 2.8. And it says, none of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would never have crucified. And so Satan's victory turned to be his greatest defeat. Verse 18. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. And there he fell headlong, his body burst open, and his intestines spilled out. Isn't that a pretty picture? We find out in, uh, in Matthew 27, verse 9, that, that, Matthew, or that uh, Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. That was what he got for his treason, okay? And that's throughout the Old Testament. We have different segments of that. And I want to read one out of Zechariah. 
Zechariah 11, verse 12 and 13. I told them, if you think it's best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. And so what happened, of course, was that after Judas had betrayed him, he felt great remorse. He went and he took the 30 pieces of silver and he threw it in the temple or told him to take it back. He threw it in the temple. And they said, you know, that's, that's your issue. That's your problem. But they took the money and they bought a potter's field to bury people in. Now, the last thing Jesus said you know, on the, the night that he was betrayed, and he told the disciples, someone's going to betray me. And, you know, it's whoever dips his bread into the dip. And he said, it would be better for that man never to have been born. Now, to me, that doesn't sound real good. It says, it would be better if you have never been born. Verses 19 and 20. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called the field in their language, Ekodema, that is a field of blood. For Peter said, or for said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. So it's very interesting. Sometimes we think of, of you know, the disciples as illiterate men. But here, Peter pulls up Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 for this occasion. So what I'm saying is that they knew their scripture. And in many cases, many of them would have it even memorized. All right, 21, 22. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us this whole time. That the Lord Jesus went out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us to the resurrection. Now, this couple verses is kind of very uh, controversial because there's many scholars who believe, let me just put this idea in your mind, was this the Holy Spirit or was this Peter's idea? Think about that for a second. Was Peter led by the Holy Spirit, or was this, you know, how Peter, like on Mount Transfiguration, pops up and says, hey, we'll make a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and for you. No one was telling him anything about building something. So sometimes he was um, maybe ahead of the Lord, but there are many who believe, probably I'd say more than do not, believe this was Peter being a little presumptuous, that who the twelfth disciple was to be was to be Paul. Because, you know, in first, uh, or Revelations uh, 21.4, it says, each of the twelve foundation stones has the name of the twelve apostles. We know Judas's name is not on one, all right, so who would be on that other 12th stone? And it's also interesting that 
Matthias's name is never mentioned again in Scripture after this point. So anyway, it's just kind of food for thought because the Lord uses broken vessels. You know, the apostles were great men, but they were humans, and they made mistakes. So that's something you can dwell on and think about, have your own opinion on. Okay, verses 23 through 26. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Bersabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostles' ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. And it's interesting they, that they cast lots. Now, they did that sometimes in the Old Testament, but this is the last time that we have any indication of this happening in the New Testament. So, you know, you can go back and talk about, you know, putting a, a fleece out. And we can talk about, you know, they, they cast lots occasionally to see they had the Urim and Thurim that for the priest that would have that would pull out a stone and give an answer yes or no. But this is the last time we even see that used because in the New Testament, from here on out, once the Spirit was poured out, that's not how they did things. In fact, let me give you an example. Uh, just later in Acts chapter 13, Verses 2 and 3. I'll, I'll just start with one. In the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So after this, normally that's how it would work. It would be a leading of the Holy Spirit, sometimes through prayer, through fasting, where the Lord would lead them. And the Spirit would speak to individuals and would be um, verified or confirmed through others that this is what we do. So there are some questions about, you know, Peter gave them two choices. Well, were they the true two choices? I don't know. Now, even though I said that Matthias has never spoken again in Scripture, but there are also some other apostles that were never talked about throughout the rest of the New Testament, too. So that doesn't necessarily prove anything. But just, again, food for thought. So we see how during this period of time, the Lord has been resurrected. They're, he's appearing again to them over a period of 40 days, kind of popping in, popping out, teaching them. I'm sure they're asking questions. And then he's preparing them for the day that he's going to be leaving. And he's trying to set them up so they'll be prepared for when he's gone to carry on that mission. And a lot of it is to be the witness. And that word martyr is actually the word witness. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to die but many of them, in fact, probably all of them except probably one, were martyred. And we have uh, the first one being the Apostle James, who was the first one killed. And then we see a change in leadership because later you have James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, who becomes the, the head of the Jerusalem church. 
And so as history begins to go forward, we begin to see here they are. They're waiting to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. They had received the Holy Spirit. It was in them, but they have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And once that happened, that changed everything. And it's, and it's very interesting how at that time of, of Pentecost, we had all these people, all these Jewish believers, well, not believers, Jewish people that were in Jerusalem and some converts from all over the world come to Pentecost to celebrate Pentecost. So that all the nations of the pretty well-known world were there, just happened to be there at that time that the Lord poured out the Spirit. So again, you can see the planning of how the Lord worked this. It was all planned. It was the right time for it to happen because when all these people got touched, that 3,000 on the first sermon, they went back to their nations and they took the gospel with them. So it's just so interesting to see how the Lord plans things, his purposes, and how it goes forth truly to the ends of the earth. And how for the disciples, it, it took a paradigm shift. Because again, for them, it was all about Israel. It was all about casting off the Romans, setting up the kingdom there. You know, and, and Jesus was like, no, this is a much bigger story than what you're thinking about. This is going to all the nations. It is reclaiming the nations of the world. And we're still in that process. We have not yet got to the place where every language group, every nation has had the, the gospel of the kingdom of God preached to them yet. We're in that process, and we're getting closer as mission organizations go out. And, and people like Wycliffe uh, Bible translators are getting the word in their different people's languages. So we're getting close. In fact, I heard somebody say less than 5% that we need to still continue to go that because it says that Jesus said, once this kingdom is preached to all the nations, he's coming back. And just as those disciples saw him leave in a cloud of glory, if we're still alive at that time, we will see him come in that cloud of glory. And if we're already asleep, meaning we've already died, we're coming with him, with that cloud. So it's a, a great future that we have. And I think as we go through the book of Acts, it's just interesting to watch the give and the take. I mean, you have, you have victories and you have some defeats. You have two steps forward sometimes and one step back. And so there's this constant spiritual warfare going on. And I've always been amazed at how, you know, Paul goes to these different cities, and then they will take people from another city, will follow them to that city to persecute them. And so it's, it's spiritual warfare going on constantly. And the cost that they, those guys had to pay, you know, literally giving their lives to the Lord to spread this message. So we need to be encouraged. We need to take those lessons from that early church. And I think one thing we'll see as we go through it, so much of the church, they're all involved. Again, that's one thing we, we preach about here, we, we teach, we encourage, that all the body has a gift. And all the body needs to be involved taking their place. It's not a spectator sport. So I just want to encourage you today to, again, remind yourself of that. Be in prayer constantly. That's a challenge. Use your gifts. Build up the body. And we'll see us go forward. Because I do believe there is another outpouring coming. A fresh output of revival and then an even a third great awakening that will come to this nation if we're willing to pay the price to seek it. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Your word is powerful. And, Lord, as we go through the book of Acts and just see how the early church, how they responded, the cost 
that they, they paid, Lord. Lord, may we be found willing to pay the, the cost. As Jesus said, pick up your cross and carry it daily. So, Lord, we ask that as we go through this book that you would just remind us. And, Lord, that you would encourage this people to stand in the gap, to be some of those going out in our realm of influence. We don't have to go to Africa. We don't have to be sent. Lord, just wherever it says, as you go. So as you go, whether it's your job, whether it's that circle of friends, that network that you have, be light in the midst of it. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings and your faithfulness. In Jesus' mighty name.